Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, that's some good energy. <laughs> my name is Danny New, and I'm here today, and I'm, it's my honor to be here today standing in front of all of you on this wonderful day to share ideas. This standing on this red carpet is a great experience. It's so smooth and smooth. I feel like I feel like I can never get off it. Literally, the people in charge told me I can't step off it. I might get shot. <laughs> so I'm here to talk to you today about user-centered design. In specific, how can each one of you drive innovative design and turn good products into great ones? I have an interest in you. Well, not really you personally. I have an interest of how you interact with things. To be specific, why you pick one thing over another. Why some of us pick vanilla ice cream over chocolate. Why some of us pick Pepsi over Coke. Why some people choose their boyfriend, not me. <laughs> this... <laughs> be here all night. <laughs> That is the definition of human factors engineering, or ergonomics. It's the study of the interaction between humans and their products, understanding their emotional, physical, and psychological responses, and where we design products where you, the consumer, are the driver of design. So I started first noticing this after I graduated from UC Davis. I went to Japan, and um, I did some research there, and I started noticing the differences between how Japanese people and American people design things. So as you can see right here, this is an exit sign. Hopefully, most of you are familiar with this. In the, <laughs> in the case of a fire, if you don't know what this is, I recommend following the screaming mob, so <laughs> that'll get you out here. <laughs> so suppose that you didn't understand English. How would you know that this is an exit sign, right? Plus, how would you know which direction you would go? There are arrows, but they don't really point anywhere, do they? Do they go left? Do they go right? Do I go straight? doesn't really say, does it? Also, it's red. If I didn't know any better, red told me to stop and not go that direction rather than exit that direction, right? So most of you probably think, well, Danny, it's common sense. This is an exit sign. You know, it's probably my fault for not understanding things. Well, here's an exit sign in Japan. It looks really different, doesn't it? First of all, there's a word for exit in both Japanese and English. So even if you didn't understand Japanese, you could somewhat guess what the meaning was. Plus, there's an image of a person running through a door. I think that's a hint that tells me I should be running that direction as well. <laughs> and if I need to know which direction to head, there's a big, giant arrow heading that direction. Plus, it's green. Green means go. Unless in Davis, green means stop, because you might hit one of the bikers. <laughs> so this started making me thinking, was this a common coincidence, or was it something more? So I want to start talking about some trends in products. I bought an iPhone back in 2007 when it first um, launched. I talk about Apple because they're really a group that raised user-centered design, and I want to see if I can get a free iPhone. <laughs> Call me, Tim. <laughs> Watching this. <laughs> so in 2007, Apple was the first new kid on the block. This is, remember, I want you to remember, this is when the BlackBerry and Great Motorola Razor was dominating the marketplace. So this was considered one of the newer places in there. When it first came on the market, Many people deemed it was a disaster. First of all, it was ridiculously expensive, about $600 with a contract. Please remember, this was a time where cell phones were considered almost free with any contract. In addition, it was working on one of the slowest networks at the time, the Edge network. For you young kids, that's a long time ago. <laughs> and this was a subpar compared to the 3G standards at the time. Also, the features it had were very limited. It had no way to expand memory, no GPS, you couldn't change the battery, it was also made out of breakable glass, and worst of all, it didn't even operate that well as a phone. Many people described that this, the product was dead on arrival, and that in the end, it would be nothing more than a niche product. But as we know, it wasn't. To say that it was world-changing would be an understatement. That even after seven years, most of the same glaring weaknesses that I stated before still exist today in its predecessors. And it's still one of the most iconic and desired smartphones in the marketplace. Why is that? Well, basically, a lot of people argue what the success of the iPhone is, but everyone agrees that it's the user experience. That they design products for you, the normal person. The person that has better things to do than learn how to use their phone. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is embedded in its DNA, from its connectivity to iTunes, its slim form factor, it's wonderful navigation experiences, and most importantly, a graphical user interface that just makes sense. 
It was one of the first phones where you just can look at a picture of a phone and hit it, and you were already in the phone app. It was the first product that both a toddler and a grandparent could both pick up instantaneously and understand how to use. Basically put, it wasn't about the product and the technology, but the experience you had with the product. Water. <laughs> So before we dive in, I want to talk about the standards of today's um, industry. So there's two ways people define products right there in the market. Um, and the, but in the end, they usually kind of end up in the same type of product at the end. First is a product out. It's when a company throws out a product with a certain price and certain features, and they expect it to hit this magical sweet spot, and they'll suddenly sell like crazy. An example of this would be the McDonald's dollar menu. It caters to the poor, unhealthy, and hungry. In other words, college students. The second is a market-in concept. The market is when the company decides to design the product with the market in mind, which is you, the consumers. But a lot of these questions, um, you know, with, through focus groups and surveys, often relate right back to price and features once again. As a result, we play this back and forth between, you know, number of colors and sizes and prices and who has the lowest prices. And, you know, it's, it's basic economics, right, where you have supply and demand. You know, if I have a new feature here, we should sell the price here. If I have a demand for this product and I want to increase it, just lower the price. But this balance works, and there's a reason why it works, but there's this point where it gets kind of goofy. You start to start to see extremes of products. People want bigger and bigger and bigger products. And you start to see big cars like the Hummer or small laptops like netbooks. And it drives very little innovation at the end. And it doesn't really increase user happiness from product to product. So how does user-centered design change the way we think? First of all, we should pay less attention to what people are saying and more attention to what they need to accomplish. That the goal of a great designer is to understand what the user wants, both said and unsaid. Like human relationships, a lot of our communication is nonverbal through things such as body language, frustration, and judgments and error. If men were better at doing this in relationships, we would have a lot less occupied couches in the world. <laughs> So let's do a quick experiment to show what I'm talking about. Here's two shapes. One of them is called Tequete, and one is called Maluma, OK? I want you to take a quick moment and think about which one you think is called Tequete and which one you call Maluma. So if you thought that the pointy object was called Tequete and the round object was called Maluma, then you're correct. And I believe most of you thought this as well. The point of this experiment is that this was conducted in many different countries and many different languages and the results were pretty much the same. Most people associated the right object with the right shape. Now you're thinking, why is that? Well, the scientific term is that you have two stimuli that occurs in your brain whenever you see something. First is the logical or physical stimuli. It determines things such as usefulness, shape, and weight. And does this product fit in our reality? A lot of the data we obtain from this is things like muscle activity, eye movement, and heart rate. For the shape example, you knew that one was pointy and the other wasn't. <laughs> and then we have this emotional response. This is a little bit more fuzzy. It's our gut reaction. It, it tells us how we actually really feel about this product. Does it identify who we are as an image? The data we get from this is usually user error, you know, facial expressions, and you know, errors in judgment. You know, for the shape example, you knew that one, the hard-sounding objects were associated with sharper objects. Both of these combine to create a user experience, which determines your action which determines whether you're going to purchase this, whether you like it, or you don't. And this is what user-centered design does. It taps into this motivation. It taps into this user experience to create a great user experience, which encourages you, the consumer, to make this purchase. But the key thing about humans are, is that we make a lot of our judgments and a lot of our purchases based on how we feel rather than what we say. So let's talk about a real-world example. I used to work at a wheelchair company, and we had to design a new product, a new pediatric wheelchair for kids that had diseases such as cerebral palsy or muscular sclerosis. These kids were probably living with their wheelchair for the rest of their lives. At the time, the market said that we needed wheelchairs that were safer, comfortable, and more lighter. And then when we asked the parents, they said the same thing. They want safer, comfortable, more lighter. And if you ask industry how to do this, they would say, simple. If I want it safer, let's make it bigger. Let's make it more sturdy. Let's put more parts on it. If you want a comfort, let's put more padding. That's comfortable, right? Oh, and light? 
let's just swap out the materials and call it carbon fiber or titanium and charge a premium to the customer. That'll make us more money. But as we found out that these features did very little to improve user satisfaction or make it safer, lighter, or more comfortable. So if we didn't, we decided that we weren't going to do this for this design. We understood that user comments did not necessarily mean good design choices. So if we can't follow what consumers say to us, how do you find out what they want? This leads me to my next lesson. The next thing is developing user personas. User personas are the profiles of our target audience. It encompasses the desires, needs, and ambitions of the larger demographic. And that the goal of a good designer is to take all this information and put it into one story of a person. And at the foundation of every story is how the person uses the product in their everyday lives. So let's all pr practice this. Imagine that you were parents for the very first time. Imagine that you've been wanting a child for a very, very long time. You bought a stroller, you painted the room, you even picked out the baby's name. You are feeling that it felt, it's feeling a, filling a space that you never knew that was empty. It's truly a joyous and life-changing moment in all our lives. Then you hear one day from the doctor, the doctor comes in, says, your child will never ever be able to walk again. I want you all to take a moment to let that sink in. I think that would all devastate us in some level, in some degree. All the hope and joy are now replaced with doubt and fear of how to raise this child in this world. Your priorities change from expectations of what to do with this child to preparation to how to make this child be raised in this world. So then you're brought into a room a couple months after the baby's born, and you're shown a wheelchair that looks like this. As you can tell, the wheelchair looks more of the image than the child does. But it has all the features you want, right? It has, it's big and bulky, but you probably can't fit through many doors. Look at all that padding. It looks comfortable, right? But it's pretty much immobilized in that chair. And that weight, guess what? This model chair weighs five pounds less than the previous model. But besides all these features that you thought you might want, something isn't right. There's a bigger question in the room. Is this what you want your child to be in for the rest of their life? So using user personas, we started to understand what the parents were saying behind the words. When they said safety, they meant safety with a purpose. It should be prepared for most of life occurrences, and it should not impede the, the, the users from actually enjoying their life. When they talk about comfort, it wasn't about immobilization. It was about being able to secure the child so that they can relax and enjoy their life as well. And finally, when they talk about weight, weight wasn't the issue. It was mobility. Every parent wants to take their child to the park, the zoo, the amusement park. They wanted to go to places like normal people did. Ergonomics were the key, not the weight. This leads me to the third most important principle of using, uh, user design, which is to make the experience feel invisible. Like an agile car or a good pair of shoes, good products feel extension of our will. And that a great user experience is one that we can do products what we expect them to do without any hindrance, hesitation, or questions. It's almost like riding a bike. I call this principle the anti-IKEA principle. <laughs> Serious, have you guys tried to build something in IKEA? I know it looks cheap, and it looks simple, and it looks easy enough. Don't do it, all right, it's a trap. <laughs> if you're having trouble building a bookcase, I don't think you should ante up to the kitchen set. So we started with this idea, started throwing some ideas, and um, some stuck, and some didn't. But in the end, I came up with something we're really proud of. And here it is, this is a Zippy Voyage. Looks like a stroller, doesn't it? but it's actually a wheelchair. Here it is side by side with a real stroller. You can see, you probably can't tell the difference. The goal of this design was to take the stigmatism of having a child with special needs. We realized that parents made decisions not on the most medically safe products, but the ones that made their child look less medical. It was interesting to find that as much as we like to admit ourselves that we want medically safer products, in the end, we'd rather look normal than look different. Another thing was that we found out was the mobility was an issue and the storage of the wheelchair. So we wanted to make it both quick, intuitive, and easy to use. Using a base from a very famous, famous stroller brand, we made the wheelchair collapsible in one step for easy storage in any car. Isn't it really cool in its simplicity? Finally, we made it the, the entire seat out of one unit. By having it out of one unit, it allowed it for easier transport in and out of cars, and plus making it more stronger and more secure than any other chair out there. 
All parents would have to do is press one button and they can remove their chair, their child out of the car and into any seat. The product was a commercial success and it changed the way the pediatric market viewed wheelchairs. It was truly an amazing feat that we could design a product that not only was medically sound, but made users happier. And the best part, the best part is that they never knew that we did it on purpose. Right? So let's go back to the old design. I'm telling you that this design is, is gone. We should not focus on this design. Here's a new design I want you to, to figure out, where we still care about prices and features, because everyone cares about prices and features, but there's a third element of user-centered design, where the user plays a role. It's a relationship. It's a trust, a bond, where they have equally, well, equally vested interest in the product. To the engineers and scientists in the room, just because you have the best technology in your products, as long as your customer says that it doesn't feel right, should tell you a hint to look at your product a little bit deeper. Data only tells you what works. It doesn't tell you what makes users happy. To the artists and marketers in the crowd, design for the sake of design without the user intent will only lead to frustration, misunderstanding, and confusion. Just because you understand the experience doesn't mean other people do as well. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. But the best thing about user-centered design is that it doesn't only apply to products. It applies to every single one of us. You could be a waiter at a restaurant and understand a person is left-handed, so you put their silverware on the left-handed side. It could be with your loved ones, where you buy lilies instead of roses because you know that they're allergic to them. It could be with yourself, where you find out pick career choices in your life that either empower or demoralize you. Each of you have this ability to do this. If you just dig a little deeper, observe a little more, and willing to put your ideas behind those you serve. Now is the time for each of you to change the way you design things in your world. It would be fatal for the next generation to overlook user-centered design projects. No longer can you or companies blame its problems on user error or that they just didn't get it. That world is gone and is no longer coming back. And I tell you today is the beginning and not the end for better products for us all. I want a product that has an intent of, what, uh, of who I am as a person with the intent of making products easier, simpler, and better for my life. And I believe you do too. User-centered design is the science of empathy. And I truly believe that if we apply a little bit more to our products, our lives, and each other, we can all be a little bit more user-friendly. Thank you. <laughs>